Welcome to Writers Speak, dedicated to the written word and those who produce it. I am your host, Jeannie Sloan, the author of two historical fictions, She Flew Bombers and She Built Ships During World War II. Today in the studio, I am happy to introduce Jeff Cotton. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you, Jeannie. It's really nice to be here. It's nice to have you. Yeah. And I would like to, I'd like the audience to know who you are. I'll give them a little background about you before we talk about your amazing screenplay. Uh, Jeff is a marriage and family therapist, is a certified trainer with the National Parent Association, and he has worked with abused and abandoned children for 35 years. He has written a very unique and amazing screenplay called The Reckoning of Billy Barnes. <clears throat> I know that you first wrote this screenplay as a novel. I wanted to know why you decided to write it as a screenplay. Great. Yeah, when I first wrote the novel, the novel ended up writing me. I mean, People will say, I never had writer's block. That's absolutely true. These things fell out. They came pouring out of me. Initially, when I started writing it, it, it was like transmission of 45 pages in a spiral notebook. Mm -hmm. And I got, it was universal. It was like the truth was telling me. And it became about these young homeless kids on the street, which if people know or not these days, I mean, still to this day, uh, 25% of kids are still kicked out for being gay, and you know they hit the streets early, high illiteracy rates, and what would happen if kids who hit the streets, because I worked in group homes for 35 years, what happened to kids on the street who became homeless gay teen heroes? The heroes on the end of that word is not something people expect. People expect homeless gay teens, and something, oh my heart's breaking. Heroes, it was like, what would it take for two kids who don't cut the deal, who learn how to stand up, and this one kid, Billy Barnes, is this illiterate kid who doesn't kind of have a chance. If kids are illiterate, I mean, if you're talking about the number one reason that kids end up in prison is illiteracy. 65% of the inmates at San Quentin to this day, 85% of the inmates in front of juvenile hall judges are this. So you got this kid, Billy Barnes, illiterate, thrown out of his house from Georgia, and you got choices of, gee, either you become a drug dealer or you essentially become a janitor. And so that's and where they came from. And you think really the primary cause is illiteracy. The number one reason that people are in prison is reading and writing. Because mm -hmm. if you can't read and write, you can't even get a job at McDonald's. I wonder how many people really know that. Not many. Mm -hmm. It's still one in four Americans to this day. But the fact that 65% of the inmates and 85% of the juveniles before judges are illiterate because they can't fit in. So that's what I did. I created an illiterate kid mm -hmm. who hits the streets and finally makes a choice to risk it all to kind of come to his integrity. How did you show that he was illiterate? Right away, he asked his pa, like a page four, is like, hey, pa, any, any chance of me maybe going back to school? And the father said, you can flunk out again, dumb as goddamn dirt. And a moment later, you see him in the room with like this Mother Goose nursery rhyme book writing, you know, Billy's a good boy, I am a good boy, and hides that pad in a slit in the mattress because he's terrified to show anybody that he doesn't know how to read. And it's multi-generational. His parents couldn't read either, and that comes up in the book also. That's handed down. Mm -hmm. So it's there in the book that way, and it's true. That's a fascinating component. Yeah, well, that's the biggest deal of Billy Barnes' growth. Mm -hmm. you know, he's terrified that if you can't read, you know, what do you got? So tell me, is the story The Reckoning of Billy Barnes, it, it's a wonderful title. Is this totally made up, or is it a composite of your years and years of experience. Yeah, uh, years and years of experience, 35 years in group homes. So many of the kids are functionally illiterate, mm -hmm. have come from families that didn't raise them in a way that actually, you know, could help them learn. Many times the parents couldn't learn themselves. You know, in group homes, we used to hate the parents of the kids coming in until we met the grandparents. <laughs> and then we realized <laughs> it was the multi-generational oh. transmission process. It got handed down. And in this, you get this kid who expects he's going nowhere. 
and then comes to a reckoning where he finally makes a decision, you know, based on his love of this boy Miguel and also those people, Bert and Betty, who run the diner, who believe in him and give him a chance to do something that he, in his heart, doesn't think he can do. Did you do any research at all to um, explain what it is like to be a young gay boy thrown out of his home by his parents, or was this through your own personal therapeutic experience that um, you developed this? Good, okay. Good question. I had this paragraph running around in my head at the start of the novels of a young 14-year-old kid out on the highway, no home, no destination, no hope, and that was ruminating me for a while. I didn't know what to do with it. Went to my teacher, Candy, who I was working with for about 10 years, mentioned that, and he re just replayed it back. 14-year-old kid on the highway, no home, no destination, no hope, and I said, son of a bitch, it's me. I mean, I didn't recognize it because I wasn't physically kicked out of my home. I was emotionally kicked out of my mm -hmm. home. Which so, is similar. Right. <laughs> yeah, but in that place I got, there was no home, but I was 19 then, and I had a place to be. What would happen if a kid was 16 and illiterate and, mm -hmm. and didn't know how to fit in? I mean, mm -hmm. I was able to go away to college and you know, run for my life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He couldn't. Yeah. He couldn't. You know, he hit the streets early and just you know, was leaning toward crime, as, as in the beginning of the book. If you're illiterate, you don't have many choices. You can't get a driver's license. I mean, that's how you can't fit in right away. You can't get a job, can't get a driver's license. Already, you're an outlaw, and that's who Billy is initially. He's an outlaw who would, comes home. <clears throat> would you, if you had to label uh, The Reckoning of Billy Barnes, what genre would you call it? Would you call it just a um, coming out uh, mm -hmm. genre? Um, I call it three different things. It uh -huh. Certainly it's a rite of passage, but I ultimately think of it as they're dark, dangerous love stories. They're about these boys who really don't cut the deal. It isn't Brokeback Mountain. See, mm -hmm. I came out in 1963 to myself. Those guys were in 1963. They cut the deal. One got beaten to death by homophobes and the other became asexual. These kids didn't cut the deal. They kind of came to their integrity and came to their thing together. So they're, they're suspense thrillers. I mean, they're hardcore. I mean, in that moment, people, if you're not hardcore, don't read these because you've got to be able to hang out with something, but they heal. You earn the light. So yeah, dark, dangerous romance stories, I guess, is, oh. you know, romantic thrillers is kind of how I think of them. Uh-huh. That's yeah. uh, good for the audience to know. Yeah. Um, Billy denied his uh, sexuality and he even began hating himself. Yeah. Um, and how typical is that? To this day, when people think, oh, it's much better these days, yes and no. Same 30% of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender kids try to kill themselves. 50% of transgender to this day do. 25% to this day are kicked out of their house. 29 states we can still be fired to this day just for being LGBT. You know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, fired to this day. So while it's better, some of the stats are just same extraordinary horrifying. You know, high addiction rates, high suicide rates, high homelessness rates, high joblessness rates. To this day, same issues going on. Right now, it was happening back then. But your character, we'll call him the super gay hero, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My protagonist, yeah. but okay. <laughs> um, he does come to like himself. Yeah, through the eyes of falling in love with this kid Miguel, who, you remember in The Rain Man, uh, Dustin Hoffman could not change and forced Tom Cruise to change. Mm -hmm. Miguel, his boyfriend who knows himself, honors himself, is heading for the Olympics. He's not changing. He is who he is, and it forces Billy Barnes, if you're going to earn him back, you've got to change. And that is part of the reckoning. The two worlds call Billy. You know, both the mm -hmm. criminal world calls Billy and, you know, and Bert and Betty call Billy. Both Slasher, his partner calls Billy, and Miguel calls Billy. So he really finally comes to a reckoning where he finally you know, comes to, yeah, accept himself, face himself, and finally, I am who I am. And that's hard for all of us as gay kids. All of us. You tackle some very graphic subjects, like teenage prostitution and drug abuse. 
Yeah. How are you able to write a, uh, write about um, these realistic uh, situations and scenes in your screenplay, particularly uh, teenage prostitution? Right. Because 35 years in group homes, we play out as sexual abuse victims that by the time we knew our identity, we had been societally sexually traumatized and we then, you know, essentially hit the streets early. And if you're illiterate, welcome to, how are you going to make a job on the street? Well, you know, there's welcome to prostitution, welcome mm -hmm. to criminal behavior because we can't fit in. There's no choice, yeah. really. So I think it was working with the kids for so many years and recognize the integrity behind them. Because a lot of people say, oh, those prostitutes do a lot of drugs. Well, yeah, you'd have to, to hang out with a bunch of trolls who you didn't really want to do anything with. I mean, you know, welcome to addiction. How do you get numb to be able to get into this horrifying world? But it's survival. You know, and, and there's an mm -hmm. integrity behind that survival is that these kids didn't go down easy. Um, the Reckoning of Billy Barnes was set in 1978 in yes. San Francisco. Why did you pick this particular date and place? Yeah. Well, the books were written, the book was written in 1995, but in that I didn't want AIDS involved in this in any way. Because after 82, I mean, I was part of the Project Shanti working with, you know, AIDS and uh, for about, from 82 to about 2000, AIDS and gay were just synonymous and I just didn't want that to be what this story was about. So I said it right before that, because mm -hmm. I didn't want it touching it. Yeah, uh -huh. be, that's very clever, because it gives a different take on the situation, a different angle, uh, because when it's about AIDS, that's about all you can focus on, really. Right, and 19... When there's so many more components to it. So many more components to it. That's true. Yeah. But this was in the birth of the San Francisco gay rights movement, so it, it became an historical novel then to the backdrop of the birth of the San Francisco gay rights movement, because in 1978 you had the birth of the gay flag, there was a proposition called Prop 6 which would have fired any teacher for being gay or any straight teacher for supporting gay rights. It came, Harvey Milk was there then, uh, it was the Milk Moscona assassinations were there, there was a political action group called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which exists to this day, but that was birthed in about 1978. So that was to the backdrop of this extraordinary time in San Francisco. The White Knight Riots, where when Dan White, the killer of these two people, got off with essentially involuntary manslaughter when it should have been either death penalty or prison in life, and gays went nuts. You can watch Billy from internal homophobia to gay acceptance to finally being here I am, and you can watch him arc along with what was going on in the history of that moment. And so it became really exciting for me of who this kid is. Well, tell us about the story of the reckoning of Billy Barnes. Uh, okay. So he's born in Georgia, and... Oh, the South. <laughs> the yeah. rural south yeah and a that's a tough one <laughs> redneck rural south yeah it's bad enough it's hard enough to be in the south then yeah and he was trailer trash i mean essentially he was a trailer kid and when he essentially got set up by this other kid that he stole this money that he didn't steal mm -hmm. he got beaten mercilessly and his mom threw him out. His mom said, we're done, you know, we're done, you're out. And at that point he hit the road and with no clue where he was going. And how old was he? At that point he was 16. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but kids get kicked out early. And my first boyfriend got kicked out at 13, recognized as a openly gay kid, recognized at four and five years old because he just was a femme boy. So Billy got recognized early and got thrown out early. And when he gets picked up by his first hitchhiker, this guy Delmar, this guy says, well, you know, I lived in San Francisco for two years like a king, and Billy's a how? You know, and Delmar kind of, you know, introduced him, here's the possibility of what you could do. And so then Billy has a way to be able, oh, I know I can, I can get by, you know, which is, I mean, it's total desperation. How will you eat? How will you have a place to live? You know, it is. It's food, clothing, shelter. I mean, the very beginning of that, and that's what hustling is able to give a kid well, in the beginning. Well, when you're kicked out of a home, that's what you're losing. Yeah. Food, 
shelter. Yeah, so it's, you know, what's interesting is, is these days people say, yeah, it's a lot better for LGBT. It is. The three major concerns of lesbian, gay, bisexual kids right now are not getting bullied in school, being accepted by their families, and not being ostracized by their friends. The three major concerns for heterosexual kids right now are getting good grades, getting a good, good job, and getting a good financial life and career. See, they're already up and belonging. Gays and lesbians, we're wrestling with survival and safety, just trying to be okay, and that's going on to this day. So yeah, Billy's wrestling with survival, hits the streets early, and gets involved, gets taken under the wing of kind of a Fagan-like kind of treacherous sociopath slasher to teach him how to enter into this crazy world that they you know, of hustling, but also he has a hotel room now, he has money, he's able to live. You know, and that's important, it's like, yeah, that's survival. What survival. wouldn't we do to survive? I mean, any of us, what wouldn't we do? And Billy will do anything in the beginning until he's touched by Bert and Betty at a diner where suddenly he's touched by a feeling of home that these people, like him, and he touches something in them that he doesn't know what that is until much later. And so he takes a risk. When he knocks on their door, can I get a job? And Bert says, have you ever held a job? He said, uh, besides painting my trailer, uh, no, sir. And then Betty says, can you read, honey bunch? And, he's, and he gets really squirmy, and she says, we'll hire you with one condition, that you learn how to read and write. And there's this deep call, because inside, he's dumb as dirt. And he doesn't think that he can, but yet they're offering, we're going to take you in and we'll teach you how to do something. And that is part of the conflict. It sounds like it's easy. Oh, why not jump for Burton Betty's? Internally, he's not bright enough to be able to read. So that's a scary proposition that mm -hmm. how to be less than anything but a janitor or a dishwasher, which aren't great careers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's part of that. And then um, Miguel comes into the situation. Yeah. Yeah, and Miguel, again, another boy kicked out. Mm -hmm. But Miguel has a lot more skills, a lot brighter kid. He's already had a scholarship to UCLA. He's a little gymnast who's going to head for the Olympics. And in there, when he mentions the Olympics, at one point, Miguel says, yeah, I'm thinking about going for the Olympics. And Billy, being from Redneck, Georgia, he, he, Billy is, Christ, he says, I heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Miguel actually smiles, hides his smile, but he has dreams, and he's an openly gay kid, and he knows who he is. And so when he gets the big mixed message from Billy, because Billy both is attracted to Miguel, but totally freaked out by the attraction, and finally, you know, he starts talking about fags and all this stuff, and Miguel is, you know, are you stupid? Is like, are you being intentionally insulting? I am, and I'm done with you. And Billy is, you know, don't leave. I don't hate you. And Miguel says, no, you hate yourself. I'm done, goodbye, good luck, and puts Billy right up against what he really wants and who he really is. And it's hard for almost any gay kid I know. Most of us prefer to be bisexual if we could have. I was hoping against hope I was bisexual. There was a place I could fit in. My partner Doug at 10 years old, 10 years old, was praying, please, may I never be gay, may I never be homosexual. And who would pray for that? I mean, who would pray for that unless you knew inside your being that's who you were? So Billy is homophobic while he's simultaneously <laughs> homosexual, which is true, which is true. Many of our worst detractors are secretly gay. Right now to this day, that's who shows up as, you know, our real, you know, antagonists who hate themselves. When you uh, wrote the screenplay, did you imagine certain actors playing the parts? Some authors do. Yeah. That's why I asked. No, it's that. a good question. More Bert and Betty than anyone in some oh, way. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy could have oh. been Bert and Betty for me. Oh, you know, isn't that cute? Billy was going to be a tough. Uh, Billy was a tougher kid, and all I knew is he he need to be a street savvy kid who wasn't overly bright because he's not bright that way. He's street smart that way. So he wouldn't be a highly intelligent kid, but he has this great kind of moral integrity that, that when Bert and Betty's get threatened by his partner Slasher, he stands up on that roof to stand watch over Bert and Betty because there's a place he's not going to let anything happen. So yeah, some, someone like that, uh, and I don't have an actor in mind for him. Mm -hmm. You know, it's actually kind of funny. If I had one actor in mind, it was Rupert Gint. He, he, he was like Harry Potter's sidekick, you know, but w way back then, because he wasn't a bright kid either, Ron, Ron Weasley, I guess, whatever his name was in, in, in the Harry Potter. But he had the same kind of, he didn't look bright. And Billy isn't bright that way, but he's strong. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's about as close as I came, I think, to it. Do you find that there are uh, certain writers um, or screenplay writers that inspire you to um, write? Huh. Actually, no. Um, the thousand page book came out and when you asked how it happened, my friend who I made the trailers with was reading the Little Dragon juvenile hall scene. He said, oh, this is so visual. Let me show you how to transfer it over. And, and he, you know, we did final draft and he oh. showed me the first two pages of, oh, the character, dialogue, action. And it just then wrote itself that way. I mean, probably my, my favorite of the writers would be Tony Gilroy, who did the Bourne series and Michael Clayton. I thought he was just an incredible writer because he was spare and bare to the bones. And that's what the screenplays became. There, there were hundreds of rewrites on Billy Barnes, no kidding. Multiple contests before it became an award winner because when I first pitched it, first person turned it down and said, this is a much bigger story than is currently written. You don't know how to write a screenplay. And that was true. I mean, you've written novels before and we have the freedom in a novel to say what we want to say in the detail. Screenplay is a laser beam. Yeah. Every scene needs to justify itself, move the story forward. So Tony Gilroy, I think, was my hero because the Bourne series and Michael Clayton were like intensely, you know, bare to the bone. Here it is, and here's the story, riveting, move it forward, that story. Well, um, tell me about the um, screenplay and about the awards. Yeah. It was, well, this is kind of funny, okay. Back when this was written, I mean, a screenplay is supposed to come in 120 pages max because it's about one minute per, you know, so a two-hour screenplay would be 120 minutes. Many people want to see a 90, you know, 90-page screenplay because that's more like an you know, hour-and-a-half movie. When this won its first award, it was 140 pages. I mean, it was bloated. And at first, when I started reading it, the guy said, oh, my gosh, the evaluator, this is a gut-wrenching thriller and it's enthralling from page one and that was bloated then and since then it's down it came down around 120 pages so even then the heart of it was there because we talked about passion between us like nothing drives the story forward like you know the author you know almost needing to tell a story yeah and, and uh, that's what you mean by it wrote itself when you sat down it was yeah. in you it's something in you and it came out Yes, it wrote yep. me. There was a, a yep. line I saw about Tennessee Williams at one point, and he had written the story. He was writing a book, and he had a main character, and his comment was, the character turned a corner, met another character who took over the book. <laughs> and I just love that because Billy Barnes was always the side character in the book of Little Dragon, the boy who came home. The book was always about this other boy, Mike, from a book called Little Dragon. Billy Barnes was a side character, and suddenly out of nowhere, came the Billy Barnes screenplay, and I was working with this guy, Eric Bork, who co-wrote Band of Brothers and Earth to the Moon, two HBO miniseries that were produced by Spielberg and Hanks. And uh, I showed him the first 50 pages of Billy Barnes, and he was, oh, he said, my God, this moved like a house on fire. He said, I was continually riveted by what would happen next, because I never knew what was going to happen next. And that's true throughout the screenplays in the books. I never knew what was about to come next because I was just watching it show me. I mean, the time that I knew I was really into it is when at one point Miguel asked Billy, teach me about hustling. And I was working down in this program in Bellinas. I remember I could not wait to get home to find out what Billy was going to tell him about hustling. And then I knew I was really in the book because Billy was real enough to me that I was waiting to see what he would say rather than, oh, gee, what am I going to create for this? It was like, what's he going to say? Because many times... You, know, you do have to put yourself in the other person. You're, you're in Billy Barnes yeah. writing then you're Miguel. So yeah. you have to keep moving from character to character and being that character. Yeah, because Miguel never wanted to hustle, but finally he's, he's eaten, in, you know, sleeping in alleys, eaten out of dumpsters, and finally I need to learn this. I need to know how. And Billy finally, Christ sakes, get a real job, and Miguel's, I can't. No one will hire me. I'm too young. And Billy's, okay, I'll show you. And the first time Miguel does that, I mean, Miguel bursts into tears afterwards. I mean, it's so awful. I mean, this is what people either don't realize, you know, how in survival one would have to be to do something that is so 
horrific in a certain way, and yet out of survival, where's that alternative? Um, and you know, the number of people who have been sexually abused who became prostitutes or hustlers, huge correlation between that as well. You know, for Miguel, it's total survival. For Billy, it's like, you know, this is it. Either you get this or, you know, end up a janitor. Yeah. The trailer that you had produced was so amazing. It was so professionally done and intriguing. Very original idea, I thought, that you had um, to have a trailer made for, to promote a screenplay. Usually a trailer is to promote a movie, yes. but it is to um, get producers excited about producing The Reckoning of Billy Barnes. Tell me what that was like to have the trailer produced professionally. It was, it, I was hanging out with my friend, a filmmaker. He was an Emmy nominated filmmaker. And I put the suggestion to him, gee, any chance of us doing a trailer for this? And, and at first it was like, well, what would we do? We were intrigued with it, had no idea what we would actually say. Because as you said, it's not about a movie. I didn't have the actors. We had images that, that we took and music that we took because the aim was to create the emotional experience of what this screenplay was about. And we just set about doing it and we watched it each. It was effortless in the same way is that it just started here and then meet Billy Barnes, and then meet Bert and Betty and meet the two worlds he's dealing with and meet what the choices are and then meet Miguel and then finally you come up to what the reckoning is, is that, yeah, if he stays with the Menendez crime family, he's going to lose Miguel and if he leaves the Menendez crime family, he might lose his life and almost does. I mean, so it's a wild ride of what it takes for this boy to both come to his integrity and find his way and we did that. To me, by the time the trailer finishes, it leaves you with a cliffhanger ending which I had really wanted because sometimes the trailer just gives it away. You know, at the end, sometimes I don't see the movie because, oh, that trailer gave it all. And this was the aim to make this the, the trailer that was, here's the emotional experience of this movie. Well, let's have a look at that wonderful trailer. Great. Jeff, 
I would really like to thank you for being an, on Writers Speak today, for joining us. And I would like to wish you um, uh, all the best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you very much. This has been a pleasure. Writers Speak is produced by the Community Media Center of the North Bay. I would like to thank our sponsor, the Sonoma County Gazette. And please join us next time for another episode of Writers Speak.